Well, good morning, Grace Point. Isn't God good? He's good. Even in uncertain times, he's good by the simple fact that you're online and you're here in this, per in this room in person to where we can sing this song again. That is a gift in itself because it reminds us. And in the first service, I didn't know Sarah was going to be uh, doing this song, leading into the sermon. And uh, I was standing there and I was like, God, I've been singing this song since this came out in 2017. And I can look back at certain moments in my life where I was singing this song as like it's a lifeline. Like, God, I'm not going to make it unless you do it again. But I've seen you do it before. And I haven't gotten this far without you. And you've proven yourself faithful up to this point. Oh, God, help me not to forget what you've done and who you are and who you're going to be tomorrow when I wake up. And so there is this passage of Scripture in my own quiet time this morning before I come here to minister to you guys. I go into my little secret place, which is under our stairs at our house. And like the way I've explained it, I'm like a little Jesus-loving troll under the stairs praying to my Savior, you know. And... Uh, I wanted to share this with you, and the Lord gave this to me today. Said, uh, let gentleness be seen in every relationship, for our Lord is ever near. And in nowhere does it say that we don't have to be gentle to those who are knuckleheads around us. We actually have to be gentle with those who may not even be gentle with us. But here's the, uh, here's the part that you're really wanting to hear, I know. Don't be pulled in different directions. Philippians 4 says, or worried about a thing. <sighs> How can the writer of this say that? When it comes to the things that we're facing in our lives, the heartbreak, the concern, the health issues, financial troubles, marital problems, homes that are in, like, don't worry about a thing. Why would this, con where is this confidence coming from? Well, he goes on to say, be saturated in prayer throughout each day. And here's our job. It says, offer your faith-filled request before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. And so I want to let you know that you are not bothering God when you talk to him about the details that we would call small in our lives. Don't let anybody get uh, judge you or get, come down on you when your prayers are like, God, you know, Lord, help me to get a parking space at the front, <laughs> right? God delights in the details of our lives. So don't let anyone diminish your prayers. God knows what you need to know that for him to communicate his love to you specifically. So the details matter, okay? Then God's wonderful peace. When our prayers and our days are saturated with little, saturated with little prayers, what do those look like? Sometimes a prayer can simply be, <sighs> that's a prayer that God answers. Because sometimes we just don't have the words, do we? But it says, allow your days to be saturated with prayer. And then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God. So when we say, I'll see you do it again, it's because we're fastening our thoughts. We're, we're putting our thoughts in a seatbelt and we're saying, I will remember what you've done. And because that's what you've done and that's who you've been, I know this is who you are today. Follow the example Praise him always. That we, the following example that we have imparted to you, and God, the God of peace, will be with you in all things. The God of peace will be with you in all things. And so I just declare over your life right now, in Jesus' name, by the authority of the Holy Spirit, peace be still. Peace be still in Jesus' name. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I just want you, if you're watching online or if you're here in person, I want you to make a request of two things of God in this moment. God intends to speak to you today. And he's also intending to tell you the next step. So pray right now, dear Jesus, what do you want to say to me? Help me to hear what you're saying. 
and show me what to do next. I give you this hour, my undivided attention, an open heart, an open mind. Have your way. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all could be seated. Y'all could be seated. Man, good morning. So good to see you. Let's see if I could turn on my iPad and figure out a way to be able to, I guess I should figure out what I'm going to preach, right? I'm about to do it. I'm just kidding. Well, okay. All right. We, we got our game faces on today. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Pastor David Martin. Um, we are starting a, uh, they started the series actually last week called The Family You Choose. How many of y'all were here for that, by the way? Let me just see a show of hands. Awesome. Awesome, man. We talk about Mephibosheth and uh, man, I'm nailing his name today. I sure didn't last week, but that's okay. Um, we're starting uh, the series called The Family That You Choose, and this week we're in week number two as we get into this, and it's really centered around this passage in John where it says this, but those who embraced Jesus and took hold of his name were given authority to become the children of God, and I just want to tell you and share with you yet again, when you become a child of God, when we take hold of the name of Jesus... There is an authority, there is a mantle that comes along with being a child of the king. That doesn't mean we become arrogant, doesn't mean we put ourselves in a place of judgment where we judge. That's not the authority we're talking about. The authority is to be able to see things the way God sees them and respond in the way that God would have us to and see the kingdom of God, kingdom, kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. These things happen through the authority that God has given you. You have authority. Well, David, I don't know as much of the Bible as you do. No, 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 you're missing the point. It's not about anything other than Scripture says if you're a child of God, you've taken hold of the name of Jesus, you have authority. And we're going to be talking about what this authority looks like this morning. And so our mission here at Grace Point, and we talk about it a lot because it's important, because it's a reminder of what we're about. This is our North Star. This is what Grace Point West is about, is to lead common people into uncommon life in Jesus. And we really feel that there, as we look at Scripture, there's like three different big buckets in which this is lived out and expressed. It's through connection. Last week we talked about that. What it means to have meaningful connection. But when there's meaningful connection, it's easy to foster meaningful community. When, I, when you feel like you're seen, you're heard, you're celebrated, you, you're, you're, you're acknowledged and loved and received the way that you walk in these doors, it creates an atmosphere of community, biblical community, which allows us to step into discipleship. Now, the thing is about discipleship, this is a word that most of us don't understand that used to freak me out as well because I'm like, man, I don't know enough of the Bible to be a discipler. I'm just trying to get through Monday through Saturday without losing my religion, right? No? Okay. Well, that's, that's me anyway. That's been most of my life. I'm like, oh, no, let the smart paid ones do all the discipling. No, Jesus said go therefore and make disciples. So what does that mean? Can I tell you something about discipleship really quickly? The reality is, is that all of you are disciplers today, and each and every one of you are already being discipled. But how is that? The reality is, is if you have a relationship with anybody, either they're discipling you or you're discipling them. So this is what I've told students when I used to travel and speak to teenagers about making disciples. They're like, we don't know how to make disciples. I'm like, oh, you're already doing it, and you're already being discipled. They're like, how? I'm like, think about the kid at school that's causing all the trouble, starting the fights, whatever those things are. And then have you noticed that main ringleader has a couple of knuckleheads that follows him? And they're like, do whatever he says, and they imitate him. That's called discipleship. Discipleship is nothing more than you doing something and setting an example for someone else for them to follow so that they can in turn show someone else how to do it. That's all that is. And so I think sometimes we have reduced discipleship down to just like, you know, meeting at a house and having a glass of wine and reading a Francis Chan book and like saying, okay, see you next week. No judgment, right? Did I, did I hit a little too close to home for anybody? But you know what I'm saying? We call, oh, that's discipleship. We are disciplers and we are being discipled. But it's what you're discipling them to is the question. And so, but when we are discipled and someone is following in your footprints, 
footprints, as you discover things in the Bible, as you discover what it means to live this life of a Christian, you should have one or two people paying attention to you, and they're following you as you discover. You're just a step or two ahead of them, and that's all that I am for most of you, and most of you, I should be discipled by you. You're so far down the road than I am. So this is, this is what discipleship does, but what happens is in the midst of meaningful connection, biblical community, all of a sudden, your calling will begin to reveal itself. What God made you to be, what he's called you to do, how he's wired you, because there's people in your life that are empowered by the Holy Spirit who love you, who are looking at you going, I think you could be a youth pastor like me. That's what happened to me, man. I'm like, this was in 2003. Uh, this dude named Kyle, and I talk about Kyle, but he, Kyle Donahue, big, tall, and Texas insurance salesman. He said, David, I think you'd make a good youth pastor. I'm like, man, whatever. Are you kidding me? But because there was meaningful connection, and he was discipling me, he saw something in myself that I couldn't see. And then all of a sudden, God said, no, this is your calling. And here I am. And you're like, well, maybe I think they kind of got it wrong because you're not that good. But hey, I'm stepping into it anyway, right? Thank you for laughing at that. That's the only thing y'all laughed at this morning. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, so last week, what we talked about is meaningful connection. The beautiful thing about meaningful biblical connection is it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't even matter how you see yourself this morning. The reality it is, according to Scripture, is we are invited into the family of God through Jesus to become sons and daughters of God. It's so beautiful, man. So this morning, the scene that we're about to jump into is Acts chapter 2. So if you can just turn your Bibles there. That's great. You're going to see our mission, this, this mission to lead common people into uncommon life in Christ come alive here. And in the scene that we're about to step into, I just want to paint this picture really quickly. There's about 120 men and women. And I emphasize that because I shared a couple of weeks ago, in the culture at that time, it was a man's world. And so women were kind of marginalized. They were just reduced to being those who just stay in the kitchen, serve the men. Your opinion doesn't count for much. This was not biblical necessarily, but it was cultural. Everybody say cultural. Doesn't that just tell you that the culture rarely gets anything right? Ladies, you don't, do you agree with that? Like, don't you think that the cult culture maybe at that time got, was getting it wrong when they saw, didn't see women as fully, you know, having an opinion and be able to think for themselves? No? Anybody online? Oh, my gosh. I believe that women have every right to be able to share their hearts and their opinions and are equally called and qualified to do the work of the kingdom. That's my personal opinion. Maybe by the end of this, you will agree with me as well. There we go. Good morning. Wakey, wakey. Here we go. So here's what's taking place. There's 120 men and women. I'm pointing that out again because I'm showing you that God is not just calling men to the work of ministry or to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? And there's a reason behind that. So they're hanging out, and now they received the promised indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As they're waiting, Jesus said, wait, and I will bring, them to bring the Holy Spirit to you. And so here's what's taking place. Follow what's taking place. There is a roar according to Scripture from heaven. In this moment, as these 120 common people are just hanging out in this room waiting for this promise, there's a roar from heaven that is so profound, and a wind of the Holy Spirit comes upon these group of 120 people that people from all over the region and really all over the parts of the world were in Jerusalem to hear the roar. And they go, we've got to find out what is happening so thousands of people come and hear the roar of the Holy Spirit. But what happens is they start hearing their own language being spoken. But they're from different parts of the world, different cultures, different dialects. And all of a sudden, they're hearing people speak like them. And what do they do? They dismiss it. The Holy Spirit is now in people, and they see this miracle right before their eyes and hearing it, and they're like, nah, they're just drunk. That's what it says. It was like, nah, they're just probably high on wine, right? And so they're saying these things, and it's amazing what we dismiss that we don't understand. I am convinced, and I share this with a deep, 
conviction in my heart. I'm not, I would never say this just out of my own mind because I want it to happen. But I sincerely believe that every single thing that's been put on the table, which is every area of our lives, is being reconstructed. And I believe for the children of God, what God is doing is he is calling us out of complacency. He is challenging our theological grids. I believe that God is saying, oh, no, I'm redefining and purifying my church because I want them to be able to step into the things that I have for them. This world is increasingly becoming dark and hopeless. We're in a world right now where you can get canceled. People are afraid. They, they want to keep their head down, their mouth shut, because they don't want to rock the boat. And I'm here to tell you that that is a bully tactic of the enemy to keep people in fear and in bondage. And unfortunately, too many of God's sons and daughters have also embraced this culture. And the truth is this, God has not called us to be obnoxious, but he has called us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be light into darkness. Not judgment and criticism, but light into darkness. There's a difference. These people are dismissed as being drunk, and I just want to tell you guys, I don't know what the Lord has in store for each and every one of us and for his church, but I will tell you this, God is going to do things that we haven't seen him do before. And you are going to be confronted with the same thing that these people are. They're in the presence and the wind of the Holy Spirit, and they're dismissing it, saying, the preacher is drunk. The only thing that I'm high on this morning is caffeine in the Holy Spirit, y'all. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Thank you, Starbucks. <laughs> Sponsored moment there. But here's the thing. Peter goes, Oh, no. See, now, Peter, we go, oh, I'm Peter. No. Which Peter are you talking about? Because the Peter that once was was the one that was chopping ears off of people and always putting his foot in his mouth, telling Jesus that he was wrong. That Peter is gone. He now has the power of the Holy Spirit within him. So he hears these thousands of people going, they're all drunk. What's going on? And he goes out and he says, let me explain to you what is taking place. And so Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, now speaks with a new authority. Why is that? Because he's taken a hold of the name of Jesus. And now he has the gift of the Holy Spirit within him. And what does he do? He begins to share the message of the gospel. The thing is, is if you read this account that Peter walks through, it's not really that impressive the way that he's not that eloquent. And I can relate to that. But what happens is, is when Peter's clunky words come out of his mouth out of obedience because the, the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now within him, and in us, by the way, he speaks with an authority that he wouldn't typically be able to get on his own. Actually, as a matter of fact, he starts talking, and then the people that are there from all around, they're like, aren't these guys from a fisherman village? Like, they're from Galilee. What gives these guys the right? But there was an authority because they're sons and daughters of God. So Peter shares the gospel, and he begins to explain what's taken place and why Jesus came to do what he came to do. In verse 38, Peter replied, they said, okay, what must, what, what must we do to be saved? You see, the message of the gospel pierced their hearts is what Scripture explains. Their hearts were pierced. Everybody say pierced. That means that there was a shell on the outside that typically truth couldn't get into. But the power of the Holy Spirit penetrated their heart to where it was pierced. And they realized, oh my gosh, what must I do to be saved? Just like many of you in here, just like many of you watching right now, there was a moment in which someone was prepared to share the gospel. And you heard it, and you went, oh my gosh, what must I do to be saved? Peter says this, repent and turn to God. And each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed. What I would tell you is if you're watching, welcome, by the way, and anybody in this, in this room, to become a child of God, the doorway is repentance through Jesus. That's how we get to God. And so with this word repentance, I always want to explain what it means because it sounds like, oh, no, turn or burn, right? Get saved or microwaved, whatever it is. No, that's not the word, the repent. It's not designed to be only in flame font, okay? <laughs> like one person, like nobody got that, but that's okay. This morning, maybe this is your first time here, and you're like, who is this hyper bald guy? Okay, we, we could talk about that another day, but here's the thing. Maybe this is your first time, or maybe this is your first time coming across this online, and 
trying to figure out what does it mean to know God? Like, seriously, David, I'm here because I want to know God, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Or maybe better yet, maybe you thought that knowing God and becoming a Christian or a Christ follower meant that it was trying harder. It's like dressing differently, having a different mindset. But we see here that because of what Jesus did on the cross, what he did for you and what he did for me, all of a sudden we're liberated. We're liberated from living under the idea that we have to perform in order to earn God's favor. That's what Peter is explaining Guys, up to this point, what you have to understand, these thousands of people that are listening to this guy, they're like, we want to say yes to God, but you mean to tell me that Jesus lived a sinless life for me? He actually took the test and made an A-plus for me, even though I was an F-plus person? Yes. There is no law, there's no hoop, there's no ladder, there's no cosmic nothing that we have to achieve or climb or get at in order for God to go, I like you enough to be in relationship with you. What he's explaining to them is those days are gone. Guys, that is what we receive today. There's nothing you could do to earn this thing. All we do is say please and thank you and it's given. You get to be made right with God. When we take hold of the name of Jesus going, it's on his credit and it's on his merit and it's on his promises and it's on his completed work on the cross and rising from the dead, from the grave, is what allows me to just become a child of God? Yes. The family you choose. Verse 38, it says, then you may take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. For God's promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your families. And look at this. When I read this this morning, it just fired me up. Because, guys, do you realize the next line is talking about you and me? Because it says this Holy Spirit is for you. It's for your families and for those yet to be born. That's you. This gift of the Holy Spirit, church. If you allow anything to stir your heart this morning, allow this reality to understand that you have been made holy in the sight of God. And that because you are clean and holy through the completed work of Jesus, you are now worthy to have the Holy Spirit living within you. The resurrection power of the Holy Spirit in you. You now become a temple of God. No longer hidden behind walls and behind a veil. The Spirit of God lives within you. And everyone whom the Lord has called to himself. You see, the gift of salvation positions us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, God's very Spirit, is given to us not just to save us, but to empower us. And I think sometimes what happens is as sons and daughters of God, we go, okay, all right, so now that I'm a Christian, I just got to stop looking at pornography and drinking too much. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do my best to be able to keep those things away from me. No, no. What so many, me included, for years and decades, I went, thank you, God, for saving a loser like me, right? And that sounds like humble talk. And so we go, thank you for saving such a wretched loser like me, like I currently see myself today. But because somehow we found a loophole and you have to love me, thank you. But now I got to try super hard to keep this thing going. And I got to continue to work super hard to keep myself in good graces. And we reduce that type of relationship with God down to just keep my family healthy and alive and help us to pay our bills till we go to heaven. And that is not the walk of a Christian. We, we are not here to just to kind of, man, I just barely made it. No, God has called us to way more. He's called us to way more. So understand your efforts are not needed. Did you know that you don't have to do one thing for God in your life? He doesn't need you to do anything for him. He's self-sufficient. But when he says, I'm going to give you my spirit, now you can do the things that God, Jesus, man in the flesh, is able to do. You're now able to heal. You're able now to speak with authority. You are now moved by the Holy Spirit to be able to do things that you never thought you could do because you have the Spirit of God living within you. Let me show you how this fits. You ready? God saved you by his grace when you believed. Now check this out. Just follow this order here. And you can't take credit for this grace point. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can brag about it. 
Your pastor can't brag about it going, yes, I'm saved because I'm so awesome. Can't, doesn't work. For we are God's masterpiece. If you are a child of God and you have taken hold of the name of Jesus according to Scripture, when I looked in the mirror this morning trying to get myself straightened out to be able to preach in front of y'all, I did not see a masterpiece. I see a 49-year-old bald guy. However, comma, God says when I look at your heart, I see a masterpiece. When God looks at you, I don't care what you think about yourself today. He says, if you're my son and you're my daughter, you're a masterpiece. Why? He has created us new in Christ Jesus so that we can, in fact, do the good things that he's planned for us to do long ago, okay? So this is where a lot of folks get it backwards, and I'm, I'm camping out on this because it's so crucial because we're so prone to go back to a works-based salvation, aren't we? We're just so prone to go back, I'm not delivering, I'm not doing enough, or I am doing enough, and I am delivering. Either way, self-loathing and self-righteousness are both equally destructive, the reality is we many times get back into this mindset and we think that we have to be good to be saved, but the reality is once we're saved, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to be good. There, it's, we get this out of order. So in verse 40, Peter preached to them and he said, and he warned them with these words. So now they received the Holy Spirit. They have become sons and daughters of God. He said, listen, be rescued from this wayward and perverse culture of this world. I was raised independent Baptist, meaning we were so conservative, we thought Southern Baptists were like halfway saved, okay? So I was raised in a very, very conservative upbringing, and I'm thankful for it for the most part. But here's the thing. When we see this as Christians, if we are ignorant actually to what the Bible has to say about our culture— we will begin to go, well, I'm saved, and our children are saved, and the culture is going to hell in a handbasket. And deep down inside, we would never say it out loud, most of us, but we would go, if they're going to hell, look at the way that they're behaving to deserve it. When we have this attitude about our culture and that the culture is the problem, you don't understand Scripture so don't be overly impressed with how you see your self-righteousness because when you look at culture that way, you are actually siding with Satan. We were all born enemies of God, and we were a part of this culture. However, on the other side, some of us are so loose with the grace and the blood of Jesus that we actually still live within the culture, and we love being perverse, and we celebrate those who are, and we call it open-mindedness. And open-mindedness is not open-mindedness when we go against the mind of God and the heart of God. So where is it? So, so what is he saying here? Be rescued from the perverse culture of this world. Well, see, the family of God is rescued from the world's culture, meaning we're rescued from the rules that this culture plays by. Because the reality is, guys, you can't even say that you like in and out Burger anymore on Facebook without being ridiculed and driven out of town. I did that. I'm telling you, I learned my lesson, man. I'm going to keep my in and out opinions to myself. Whataburger. I don't know what to tell you guys, but that's just dog food. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. See what I'm saying? It's a hamburger. Well, I don't know if I could sit under that kind of teaching when you got this California in and out burger guy up there. <laughs> Why they have a southern accent, I'll never know, but I always characterize those guys that way. We're not called to live in holy huddles. I think sometimes we're just so desperate, poverty-minded that we go, as long as my, me and my babies are saved, man, everyone else can just kind of figure out their lives. But that's not what God has called us to. According to Scripture, Jesus says that we are called to be salt and light. So here's the deal. We're not, we, yes, we are rescued from the culture, but we're not called to be removed from it. And there's a difference between we have to shift our understanding, guys. We have been liberated through Jesus, and Jesus tells us if we want to follow Jesus, we're going to have to follow his footsteps into brokenness, into darkness, and not become little Pharisees to throw stones and point out what's wrong with their behavior. We're here to say, I used to be an enemy of God too. 
I used to be lost in my sin. I had no hope. I had no purpose. I was suicidal. I was addicted. I was in brokenness. However, Jesus saved and rescued me through his completed work on the cross and his resurrection. And I'm here to bring the light of his truth to you so that you too could step into uncommon life. It's common to ridicule. It's common to distance yourself from people that don't look and think like you. It's uncommon to step into the worlds of those who you know, man, they probably don't like God. They probably curse him. They probably take his name in vain. Be light into darkness. Be salt and light. That means, students, you've got to take the message of the gospel and the light of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit in you to your schools, onto those Zoom calls. Folks, to your workplaces. And yes, even on 1604 on Friday in the afternoon, that is light into darkness, my friends. But when we've taken a hold of the name of Jesus, we have to understand we're rescued, but we are not removed. And so our job as Christ followers is to lead common people around us, whether they believe, look, act, make choices like us or not, into uncommon life in Jesus. Our goal and our calling is not to hide from people. We got to come out of hiding. Oh, really, Siri? Now you want to talk? Did you hear that? <laughs> So Peter preaches the good news of the gospel of Jesus, and look at what the Holy Spirit did through Peter's obedience. Y'all are ready? This old fisherman has no credibility except for the fact that he now has the credibility of the Holy Spirit testifying to what he says. And those who believed the word that day were numbered 3,000. Now understand that this number probably only represents the men that were there, okay? So they're not counting women at this point. So 3,000 becoming a reality. Last night, Ashley and I were sitting on the couch watching TV, and there's this commercial that came up. And, and it was, uh, there, the commercial involved like two, two twins, like baby twins being born. It's like a car commercial. And so, you know, little, little car seats in the back and the two cute little babies, you know. And Ashley said, my 11-year-old, she said, Daddy, she's like, can you imagine if there was like twins in our house? And I'm like, no, I can't. I said, but God will give you the grace to have them. That's all I could tell you, you know, because people do it. And she's like, yeah, I guess so. Well, guys, look at what happened here. Peter says, repent, be baptized, your sins can be forgiven. Boom, 3,000 babies are born in this day. What the heck do you do with 3,000 babies? You got to raise them, don't you? You have to raise them. And this is where I want our church to start shifting because I think that we are in this position where we go, I, I just need, I'm here to be fed. I'm here to be fed. I'm here to be fed. And the reality is, is yes, you are. However, if you know how to eat, at some point, you're going to have to also learn how to handle your own fork and feed yourself and then feed. Here comes the airplane, right? You've got to start feeding other people, okay? So what happens now? I mean, they have all these babies, just all, gaggles of babies all over the place. These new believers, and what we're about to see is the early church leading these common people into uncommon life in Jesus. But what does uncommon life honestly look like? And I think sometimes when we see uncommon, we think weird. Like, you know, have to be freaks of nature, have to be antisocial, have to start doing weird. No, no, I'm going to show you really quickly what uncommon life looks like when it comes to biblical community. And I share this with you because this is the blueprint for the church. And I want you to embrace it because now is the time. You ready? Take great notes. A true expression of uncommon biblical community is inclusive, not reclusive. Even the babies stopped making noise as soon as I said that. Do you notice that? <laughs> this word inclusive is a trigger, isn't it? Because so many of us have different ideas of what inclusivity looks like and feels like and what the rules are around inclusion. And so immediately, as soon as I wrote it, I knew I was going to have to explain what this means. But what we have to understand is if you look at verse 5 of Acts chapter 2, you'll see that we're told that literally every single nation under heaven was in Jerusalem and represented at this point. So this moment, this roar of the Holy Spirit takes place. Peter and the other 120 are now filled. All of a sudden, there's every single tribe, tongue, and nation represented, okay? Okay. And so Pastor Tim Keller explains that every culture possible, every race, every class, every temperament, rich, poor, is represented in this crowd that Peter is speaking to. And what's so astonishing is that these are people who didn't have anything in common with one another except for the fact that they're in proximity to witness this. 
but because they're from all over, um, just get this in your understanding. They have no common culture. They have no common language. They have no common personality. They have no common temperament. But the one thing that they all had in common that we all share in here today is this, our need for Jesus. That's what they shared in common. The gospel, the biblical gospel, is the most inclusive message that a human heart will ever receive. The gospel message is inclusive. The beauty of the gospel says that the things that separate people from one another, race, education, gender, geography, status, fill in the blank, all of the labels that people, all of us wear, intended to separate, to marginalize, to prop ourselves up, or to feel inferior to, are completely wiped away and done with through the blood and the work of Jesus in your life. You go, okay, all right. Let me go further, Dwayne, because thank you, man. We're tracking this morning. Look at this, verse 26. If, you, if you're like, well, you know, that just sounds like, man, some sort of universal nonsense. No, it's scripture, guys. Get acquainted with the word of God and understand what it's saying in here because you have all become true children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, the anointed one, period. Done. It was faith. It was faith that immersed you into Jesus, the anointed one. And now you are covered and clothed with his anointing. We no longer see each other in our former state. What's our former state? Jew, non-Jew, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever, rich, poor, male, female. Because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ with no distinction between any of us. We're all one in Christ, guys. We're no longer bound by what the culture says you can be and you can't be and the color of your skin or the level of your education. None of that matters. We have become new creations in Christ. We're part of the body of Christ. That is our identity start to finish. All right. Guys, if this doesn't show us something, man, that the gospel is an inclusive message, you do not understand the gospel at all. Because if you think Jesus only came to save this group of people who vote like this, who think like this, and who like this kind of preaching or music or style of car and whatever, you don't understand the gospel. The gospel this morning is being declared across the globe and people are saying yes from their perspective to Jesus in the way that he reveals himself to them. I think sometimes we diminish the work of the Holy Spirit because we don't understand it. And in our arrogance, if I could be so bold, because we haven't experienced it first, there's no way what we see can be valid. So unless we are the first ones to experience moves of God in certain ways... Many times we will dismiss and marginalize those who receive Christ, but it doesn't look like us, or their way to Jesus is, well, hold on. You mean to tell me you, you, these people came to know Christ in 2020 because someone was raised from the dead? Guys, these things are happening on our planet currently. People are being raised from the dead. Yeah, 10 o'clock, straight up, right in the middle of the service, I'm telling you, people are being raised from the dead. You won't hear those things reported. But I was sitting down with one of my buddies who I love, and he's, he's valued and trusted. And he was over, I can't remember what continent he was on. But he said, David, this is just this last year. He said, David, um, this is not even in my notes. I'm going I'm, I'm to get labeled as a weirdo. Isn't that awesome? But here's what he told me. His name's Tim Eldred. And he said, David, he said, uh, my faith has been really challenged. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I was over, and I can't remember exactly where it was now. Shoot. But he said, there was a little baby that was born relatively young, a couple weeks old, had something wrong and literally died right before his eyes. And they were, they were there to pray for the little baby died. And I hope I'm getting the story straight, but I do know the punchline. He said the little one turned blue, was dark blue, no pulse, dead for a couple of hours. And he said, we felt like we were supposed to pray for him. And so me and the local pastors prayed for this little one over his little cold body. And that child came back to life. And he said, I don't know what to do with that. I said, thank God. That's what we do. You see, Scripture talks about in the last days, these things will begin to take place more and more. 
Joel chapter 2 is now coming alive in Acts chapter 2. And so if those are considered the last days according to Scripture, what you have to understand is that 2,000 years later, how much closer are we to the end times? These things are going to start happening. Don't get freaked out. Just look at Scripture. That's all I'm asking you to do. Because in verse 42, it said, Every believer was faithfully devoted to the followings and the teachings of the, of the, the, the apostles, if I could spit it out. But look at what happened. Their hearts. Everybody say heart. Look at what happened. They were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion. They were coming together regularly for prayer. And so what I would tell you is uncommon life for Grace Point looks like this. Biblical community through the deepening of unity, worship, communion, and prayer. And I know that quarantine separated us. And I know that we're slowly but surely seeing y'all come back one by one. And it's such a blessing to have you back. But it's not just so we can fill this room up so my ego can get stroked. The reason why it matters for us to have the corporate gathering of sons and daughters of God is because there is no replacement. There's no replacement other than the corporate gathering of the saints. There's a biblical reason why this takes place. There's something that happens to our hearts we see when we're in proximity to one another. Listen, man, if anybody loves sitting in his jammies, drinking a cup of coffee, watching his recorded sermon on a Sunday morning, it was this guy, okay? Let, let me tell you, I loved my Sunday mornings, but here's the reality of it. There's a reason why we're supposed to gather together. There's something that is unspoken that takes place spiritually and literally. Lit I was thinking about this, and I thought I'd read an article recently, and it's come to find out I didn't dream it. It's actually true. There's this uh, university, the, the UCL Division of Psychological and Language Science, and what they did is they took 12 people, and they put them in a theater to watch a musical, okay? And so they're all sitting there. They don't know one another, and what they did is they monitored their brain activity and their heart and their pulse, all the rest of this stuff, Right? It says an analysis of the data showed that the subject's hearts were responding in unison to the performance. So over a period of time, their pulses synced up, even though they're in different parts of the room and they did not know each other. And their pulses increased and de decreased based upon the shared experience that they're having in this theater. It's, th this shows me that there's something that happens to our hearts when we gather together. There's something greater than ourselves that's taking place. This is why we do this. This is why we gather corporately and why it's so important we need to get back into the habit of meeting together in person now that we can. If you can go to HEB and Walmart, you can come to church, okay? So there you go. If you can go to Olive Garden, you can come to church, all right? So y'all come back now, y'all here. All right, so here's the thing. I was thinking about this, and I was like, you know, I can kind of see that to be true. Now, don't judge me and call me a pagan pastor, but listen, I, I, for like 30 years, I've been a fan of Metallica, okay? All right, so start judging me now. Um, I remember it was in 1992, and I waited in line out in the cold at Sound Warehouse off of Evers and 410 with my 30 bucks to buy a ticket for me and my mom to go to Metallica, to go see the Metallica tour. And this is the one, it was at the Hemisphere Arena downtown. Y'all don't know nothing about that. But I'm, I'm old school San Antonio, man. So I was there, and my mom was there, and we were up in the nosebleeds, but it didn't matter. And here's the other thing. So the drummer, Lars Ulrich, came out, and he says, listen, we're going to kick your butt tonight. He didn't really say it that way, but you get the idea. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's figurative. No, they actually did <laughs> because they played for three hours. And my mom and I, but there was this moment where a couple of their songs, there's this, like, response y'all acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all just fake right now, man. I know y'all know what I'm talking about. But you're at one of these concerts, right? And it was like, I can't remember what song it was, but it's the one where you chant die, okay? All right? So I know, I know. But my mom in her 50s, me, 20 years old, we're like, die, 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 right? And I know, I know. But guess what we were having in that moment? There was this 18,000 of us chanting this <laughs> together. And it's, there was a moment where it felt, it felt like church. Can you imagine like someone visiting next week and we're all, die? No, no, but here's the thing. I only share that with you because what kind of church, I don't know. But something synced us all together in that moment. I'll never forget it. It, had an, it was powerful. There's something happening in that moment that was spiritual. I'm not saying it was good, but it was spiritual. And my point is this. 
When we come into a room and we begin to sing in unison with one another, things like do it again instead of die. We say, Lord, do it again. Bring life, right? And we begin to come together. We are the body of Christ. And there's this unspoken something that takes place. And so verse 43, a deep sense of awe swept over everyone and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and miracles. And so a true expression of uncommon biblical community, as I look at Acts chapter 2, right along with all the rest of y'all, is the occurrence of miracles and wonders. And you're going to hear me continue to talk about this because I think that our lack of faith and your pastor's own paradigm being challenged is what keeps these things from happening. So here's my only challenge to you, Grace Point family. Let it not be said of us that it was because of our lack of faith that miracles and wonders didn't happen. Let's be crazy enough to trust God in faith that he can, in fact, heal someone of cancer or someone can walk out of a wheelchair or a marriage can be healed and restored when it's on the rocks. When, whatever those miracles, signs, and wonders are, guys, don't you want to see them? Isn't there a part of you? Let me ask you, let me put it to you this way. What's, what requires more faith? To believe that God can still do these things or to sit on the back row and throw stones at people who believe that God can do these things. I want to be one of the crazy ones who believes that God can and will do this. And he's been stirring my heart for about a year along these lines. And it takes guts for me to be able to share this because I understand what this stirs up. I just want what God wants. And I want what the Holy Spirit says that I can have. Y'all with me? Verse 44, all the believers were in fellowship in one body and they shared with one another whatever they had. And out of generosity, they sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Guys, I want to tell you, I feel like this is a moot point for you. I've never seen a more generous congregation than you guys. It's true. Your, guy, you, your giving, your tithes, your offerings, it's, it's blown me away. And I brag on you guys all the time for that. But that's a mark of biblical community. I'm a product of that. When I started going back to church, because I left church for about 13, 14 years just to take a little break, and uh, I was raised in church, I left church, I was gone all throughout my 20s, I had a, a near-death experience, and that kind of pushed me back into church. And so I started going to Hill Country Chapel, which is out on Highway 46, 46 a little country church. And I, my wife and I went up there, but I would show up late. I would leave early. I was the guy that didn't want to interact with y'all, okay? I didn't want anything to do with church people. I'm like, I'm not here for y'all. I'm here to figure out if God likes me, okay? That's what I'm trying to figure out at this point in my life. But my wife and I were musicians at the time, and we were playing in San Antonio, and our son David was about four at that point. We get a call. We're like an hour away the babysitter who's 15 or 16 calls and says, I've just called 911. Your house is on fire. What? So we pack up all of our stuff in our car. We fly up to Pipe Creek, which is where we were living at the time. And we pull up. And then, I mean, the fire truck was there. The house was still smoking. And it was like this plastic siding on the side of the house. And it looked like a marshmallow had just thrown up all over our house. It was just like this melted mess. And we didn't have renter's insurance because we were just these young musicians. Don't Dave Ramsey judge me, okay? We were just trying to figure things out, you know? And so we go, oh, my gosh. What are we going to do? We don't know anybody. What are we... We're on the hook to, to fix this house. We, we could barely keep our lights on. Guys, that church that I showed up late to and left early for, within one week, six days, Mike Vogt, who is a contractor in Bernie, provided all the materials for the roof, for the whole front, the facade, the porch, everything to be rebuilt. And on that Saturday, not even a week later, there's about 25 folks, women bringing meals over for us and men out there remodeling our home in one day. They had a new roof on there. They had a new port. Everything, it, you wouldn't even known. And they didn't know us. And I was standoffish. And here's the thing. I'll never forget this. And this is the moment that turned me around to ultimately become your pastor. This influenced me and impacted me. You know who I saw on the roof swinging a hammer? My pastor. Pastor Skip Marks. He was up there. I'll never forget. I'm looking up there and he's swinging a hammer. And I'm like, okay, if that's what church looks like, then I want to be a part of something like that. They put their money where their mouth was. They were generous. Yes, tithes need to go to the storehouse. But the generosity, the radical, systematic, proportionate, and sacrificial giving of the church is represented through radical, uncommon generosity. May we continue to press into that because I'm a testimony of that. 
So daily they met together in the temple courts and one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. Man, what a beautiful picture. As the band comes up, as I just wrap up this understanding of where we're going for unbiblical or for uncommon biblical community, it's the frequent and faithful gathering corporately in homes to share communion and eat meals with one another. We're family. And they were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. It says shortly after that, a couple thousand more. And here we are 2,000 years later because of this. You have the Holy Spirit in you if you're a son or a daughter of God. To experience and to walk with the authority with the same things we see Peter and all the 120 doing. Maybe you're here and you're like, I want to be in the family of God. I didn't understand. I thought it was other things. But you're saying that if I just put my trust in Jesus, I can become a son and a daughter of God and that will never change? Yes. How many of y'all would say you've prayed that prayer before? Just put your hand up so those in here can find courage to understand that, yeah, we've said yes to Jesus. If you, say, if you have said yes to Jesus, put your hand up. Be proud about it. Family of God, look at you guys. We want to invite you into that. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. And maybe this morning your heart has been pierced. Scripture says that anybody that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you want that, just pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. But in this moment, with the faith that you've given me, I put my faith in you. I want to exchange my sin for your forgiveness. I want to exchange my life for your life, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. And in this moment, make me clean. Make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I make you the Lord and boss of my life. Just begin to thank him for saving you right now. And I'm going to ask you to text grace to this number on the screen, 484848, if you just prayed that prayer online. But if you're here in person and you just prayed that prayer, I'm not going to make you do anything weird. But when babies are born, we want to know it. And so if you just prayed this prayer and you meant it from the bottom of your heart, I'm just going to simply ask you to raise your hand boldly at the count of three. One, two, three, put your hand up if you just prayed that prayer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who else? Who else in here? Who else? Grace Point, I'm going to challenge you every time. When a baby is born, listen, when your babies were born, you gave better than a golf clap. I know that. You were posting pictures. You were celebrating. Awesome, man. Awesome. So what we're going to do is we have two elements before we wrap up today. We're going to take communion because it'd be silly to talk about taking communion and then not do it, right? The other thing is we're going to celebrate baptism. This is an Acts 2 morning, guys. This is an Acts 2 morning daily being added to our number. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is stand to your feet. I'm going to ask you to inspect your heart. And the ushers are going to show you quickly how to be able to get communion. I don't want us to be irreverent and rush, but your pastor went a little bit long today. And so we need to be sensitive to time. So grab your communion, come back to the chair as quickly as you can, and we'll take it together. And then we're going to celebrate a baptism. So do that now.
So, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, it says that he took the bread and he lifted it up and he said, and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread. Then after supper, he raised another cup of wine and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. A covenant sealed by my blood. He said, drink this. Remembrance of me. So let's take the wine. He said, do it often. And remember what I've done. And because you've taken the communion, guys, that is symbolic and is representative of what God has done for you. He's paid it all. You are a masterpiece. You are loved. Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you could walk accordingly. And so this, all right, man. I was wondering about you yesterday morning. Welcome back. So you exchanged your life a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it was our first or second Sunday back. This young man. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sketchy on the name. Is it Martin? This is, it. This is Antonio. Is, Antonio. Dang it. All right, all right. Um, welcome, Antonio, to the baptismal waters, guys. <laughs> all right. Take yeah. it away, Ruben. As, uh, as Pastor Dave said, it was our very first Sunday back. Antonio and his mom came up to me like, hey, man. Check. There we go. There we go. Um, the very first Sunday back, Antonio was like, okay, what do I got to do to get baptized? I was like, show up and we'll dunk you, man. And uh, so he went and sent me his, his uh, story a few weeks ago, and it's powerful. So let me just read this to you. Antonio says this, before I gave my life to Jesus, I struggled. I struggled with lustful thoughts, bad habits, and anxiety. I had idols and only cared about earthly things. One day, a post came up uh, out of nowhere on TikTok. For the older generation here, TikTok is a social media platform with short videos. And, it's, and it asked the question, are you uh, a lukewarm Christian? I couldn't get that question out of my mind. The next day, I felt like I was supposed to close my bedroom door and put on some Christian music. I raised my hands and 10,000 reason reasons came on. I felt the presence of God and started crying. I had goosebumps. That day, I gave my life to Jesus. After exchanging my life, my life has changed. He has freed me. I go to him for my struggles and fears. Every morning I wake up, I pray to him. I was a slave to sin. Now I am free in Christ because Jesus died for me. Amen. Antonio, based on your confession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death and raised to new life in Christ. Amen. Amen. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Praise God for you, Antonio. God is pursuing people. And he is choosing you to join in partnership with him so that his heart was pierced. There are those within your life whose hearts are pierced. I've already preached the sermon. I'm filled. I want to do another one, but I've, I won't give you a second scoop this morning. But here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. At the, at the beginning of our service, you ask God, tell me what you want me to hear and tell me what you want me to do. And so now that you've heard from the Lord today, go do it in Jesus' name. See you guys next week. Love you all. <laughs>